Welcome, everybody, to the inaugural episode of Church Hurts and (laughs) the one show that's going to really take a look at our spirituality in depth, examining what's working, what's not, and what can we do about it with the one man who spent a lifetime trying to answer all those questions, John Bash. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. It's good to be here as we look at the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality. How's that for a a challenge? That's something we're not going to do in one episode, that's for sure. That's a journey we're on here. You've been on this journey for a while. Tell us who John is. You know, I've... uh... I've been a church pastor. I'm one of those guys that people complain about, you know, <laughs> when you talk about church hurts, people are going to start talking about the ministers, the pastors, the priests, right? right? Right. So I was one of those guys for a long time and started churches and uh, pastor big ones and little ones and then went on and worked with churches outside, helping them raise money. So that really gets some more controversy into the equation. Yeah, exactly. It? Exactly. Money in church. Those aren't, we don't need money in church. It just happens here. Let's add some politics. <laughs> and, you know, you know, and we're going to do that today, Paul, a crazy beginning. Imagine we're going to start looking at issues about church by looking at somebody who doesn't even live in America. And, and from somebody who grew up in a place where there were no churches, where, where they went so far under communist rule to say church, pah, well, that's, a, that's just the opiate of the masses. We don't need that nonsense here and, and, and banned them or limited them severely. Who's your guest? Introduce your guest. You know, I think you need to meet Theodora. I mean, what a treat to have you here. Um, for she, American- she's nodding, so she must agree with that here. She, she's <laughs> nodding that she's... <laughs> Only her second time in America, and the last time was 20 years ago in Brooklyn, New York. So you can imagine wow. what Southern The California. two extremes, yeah, right. Yeah. So, Theodora, um, to the American audience, I think they're a bit like me. They even struggle a bit with your name because it's foreign to us. T-E-O-D-O-R-A. Yes, it's kind of Greek name. A Greek name. And yeah. what's your last name? You said right. Theodora. Theodora Papazi. Papazi. Also that's a Greek that, name. That sounds Greek. <laughs> and that accent to me sounds kind of, I'm, I'm not a, I'm kind of a student of accents. I don't know what a Romanian accent is supposed to sound like, but it does, it sounds more Greek to me. Well, that, is, uh, let's leave that one where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds Greek to me. It's all yeah. Greek to me. Let's move on to the question for you to begin because it's gonna take us a little bit to get to the church spiritual side of this. We need to put Romania in context. When when I was there for half of a year, a couple years ago, the first question people had for me was, why Romania? And after I got done dodging that question, um, as I will do right now, the second question was, where? is Romania. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could you kind of give us the basic introduction, Theodora, to where's Romania? Well, Romania is the in the eastern part of Europe. We have neighbors like Ukraine, Bulgaria, Black Sea. Russia? Russia is oh, after Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> Moldova, if you know where Moldova is. Okay, on the other side. Somebody's got to tell me about Moldova. I always look on a map and I see the country of Moldova and I have no idea who the Moldovans are, what the language is or anything. It's Romanian. Is it? It was a part of uh, the big Romania. We lost it. Uh, I don't want to say it and be a mistake. I don't know exactly when we lost it. <laughs> but I, but because I thought there was an always a contention of the border with Romania, even when it was the USSR, when it contained the Ukraine and Russia, yes. then that part broke away. That part was part of the USSR. Right. And then the, the border, so that, that border area, and I, I thought it had something to do with Moldavia. Now, Paul, area. your job is to keep us on track. <laughs> Not to take you, us down the rabbit hole. You are taking us <laughs> That was, I was thinking ahead of time for the show. How, <laughs> You're absolutely right. How, how do we... Um, really get to where we need to get to. So I'm going to jump on another track a little bit because um, I could have introduced you as the head of the Communist Party because when you were in high school, you were the head of the Communist Party in high school. What was the position called? (laughs) Oh, dear. Um, I don't know if we had a position, but I was responsible with whatever what happened in the political way 
in a week and I had to read all the papers and come into the classroom and explain to my colleagues what it's all about. So really, it kind of is like being the teacher's pet because you got it because you were the best student in the class, right? One of them, yes. Okay. And, <laughs> and so We were in, a good class. In any case, part, part of that growing up in this time, um, basically Romania, which to us, you know, for me, I just looked at Eastern Europe and I look at communist and communism and I lumped it all together. And it really took some time in Romania to realize that for you guys, um, f for people in the West to be lumping you in with the Soviet Union and with communism in general, it, 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 we must just feel so ignorant. I mean, to, from your perspective, explain Romania compared to the USSR and communism real quickly. Well, we are never part of the USSR. We are uh, its neighbor, and we really didn't like the Russians, but the political people have to because we were under the rule of the Iron Curtain. So you were under the Iron Curtain, but you were one of the, one of those separate, independent country. Uh, separate Nothing to do. Uh, that that means Eastern Bloc, not Eastern USR. Bloc, yes. And um, so, in any case, you just grew up in that environment. You didn't know anything different. No, it was how you are born, and where you lived, and this is what what it was. And for a time it was okay. When did it become communist? This is after World War II, so like 46, 47? 54. Something? Oh, 54, 1954. Okay. So, uh, and you, and so from your whole life you were in the communist, in but the your communist. parents weren't, or your grandparents yes. weren't. My pa grandparents uh, um, lived a life under the kings, and uh, it was fine, it was good. They had uh, their own land, their own restaurant, after the communists came, they took away the land and uh, the restaurants or whatever stores they have. So this is part of the picture that we had of when communists, communists came in, people lost their property, they lost their homes, they lost they were everything. Locked. Some of them were uh, sent to prison, especially intellectual people, academic people, priests, uh, students, even normal people but uh, who had a strong voice and an opinion yes they have an opinion <laughs> yeah um it's it is um i think particularly interesting to it for us to picture the prior to all this though romania is one of those countries that we get lost in when it comes to the royalty of europe and in fact um just to go back a little bit because you really um, to connect the united states to romania the last major event that I can picture, at least and put on a calendar at all, is when you had a very great queen. And uh, she was a, a very popular figure uh, in Romania. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about her, because she came to America and was quite a hit in, what, 1920 or something. Yes, uh, Queen Mary. She was a good... Uh advocate for Romania. She came uh, even in America and he, all Europe. She was uh, related to the Queen of England, being uh, the niece of Queen Victoria and uh, the cousin of uh, King, uh, the Tsar of Russia. Uh, they are all related. Yeah, we, we don't want to get into uh, European royalty, mm -hmm. except to say it's fascinating to imagine um, that here is this woman who um, is a nephew of Queen Victoria who had determined she wanted all of her offspring to a, marry. A, a niece, you said nephew. Um, a niece. Niece, yeah, niece. Yeah, a niece, right? not a nephew. <laughs> <laughs> that would get into modern issues. That would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Gender change <laughs> issues. We were, right? and, but going from that kind of a, a royalty, and as you look back throughout the history of Romania, and we need to move beyond this because we take forever. Yes. But I got I to gotta interject one more okay. thing, though, because I'm going to show off my one little bit of knowledge about Romania. Romanian is a language that's related to French and Spanish and Italian because it was found, it was a Roman colony, which is, I believe, why it's called Romania. Cause well, it, this is something that... Uh, um, you could go off on forever. Yeah. But so it's not because as far off as we think it is. Latin right. language, but we were under the Romans only for 200 years mm. and only a part of Romania, not in the south. Okay. And... Uh, 
uh, there are uh, people talking articles that Romanian language was before. My only point well, simply <laughs> being that we think of Romania as far off and far away and far different than us, and there are more similarities than you would think, right? And, yes. and let me just uh, put an exclamation it's mark. 80% Latin language. So you're talking about, the, really, it's the only Romance language in Eastern Europe. In the Europe. Eastern exactly, part, yes. Right. We and are surrounded the, by Slavics. Right. And the debate with Romanians is they say their language preceded Latin. Yes. So yes. it's some of the, that's kind of culture way beyond, for us who in my lifetime celebrated the bicentennial, you mm -hmm. guys deal with history in, I can't imagine what history was like in high school when you have thousands of years. Oh, it was hard <laughs> <laughs> to remember all the names, all the years, mm -hmm. uh, all the things that it happened. So can I ask and one more question? So you're growing as a kid in the communist uh, yes. country, you, you're excelling under this system. Did you sense or from any of your older relatives a loss, a lack of religion, or was it just that's just the way it is? Because you obviously weren't going to church, I would think, and there was no religious study under a communist rule. We didn't have studies, but by luck, uh, we are we lived near a church. Our fence was common with the backyard of the church, and my best friend's grandfather was um, a priest there. So we went there to clean the church, to uh, make it look good when um, it was a holiday, a religious holiday. Otherwise, we were not going to the church, not with family, not on Sundays. It was something banned in Romania to go there. Right. So let's, let's leap into that. Paul jumped right exactly where I was going to go. Um, you had the... the contradiction of living in a country that now under communist rule as you were born and grew up um, officially was an atheist country and yet on the other hand um, one time I uh, asked you um, I was trying to find out your personal beliefs and and you responded uh, it felt like incredulously to me you said but I'm Romanian and by that you meant that you were orthodox. So, yes. so here you got this, it's illegal politically, in a sense we're atheists officially. On the other hand, I'm Romanian, so obviously I'm orthodox. Explain a little bit of that contradiction. Um, we kept to ourselves our religion, our beliefs. We didn't talk about them because we have another institution that was looking and hurting us and uh, they have people everywhere the secret police was everywhere and um, you kept to yourself but uh, we didn't lose our religion into the family so so there was a private um, believing and for some people they still were able to go to the church and you go around in Romania and there were some churches that were actually destroyed um, by the ruler Cochescu Yes, right. he destroyed only in Bucharest 21 churches. Some of them were uh, very old, very important for the history of Romania. They couldn't be saved, but it was a very brave engineer, Yert Kescu, it's a hard name, uh, that saved some of them by moving them on wheels. And it was a good invention at the time, and he saved a few, 11, I think. And so I experienced, as I went around, I still saw a lot of churches, um, and yet um, it seemed that they were pretty empty. It's, it's a lot like going to many churches in urban centers of America that are large, um, that were churches built for thousands um, that would have tens. Um, and it seemed that way in Romania too. Uh, your restaurant is right across the street from actually um, a cathedral. Yes. Uh, um, an Orthodox cathedral, and really very few people seem to be going in and out of that church. Yes, because we grew up with this for 50 years, our parents, us, even children, young children, and um, we just used the church because of the fear of uh, something bad to happen to us, so we went there only for baptizing children, burials, and commemorating our deaths. This is something that so we did do the for church seven years. Hurt anyone? I mean, did did people feel like uh, this? There must have been people. Uh, communism in general, said 
churches, the OP to the masses, forget it. We don't need all this stuff here. We're a modern world. Um, and I think, I think what's interesting about this conversation, you lived where we're headed, which is a churchless state. Now, it was forbidden there. It's not forbidden here. But in Western Europe and in America, church attendance continues to plummet. More and more people end up saying, eh, who cares? Did, did you care? Did you miss anything? Did you feel a loss or was it just not even, you don't know what you don't have? You're right. I didn't know what I have because uh, growing up, <laughs> it was what you got. It was something that everybody did. And that something that everybody did was kind of, um, they had that church in the history of their family. At the same time, they're experiencing, no, but we know the um, the secret police, I guess we could just call them, the security there. Yes. But really, the those who are spying on you, who aren't in uniform, who have political influence that affects your jobs. And the, some priests were uh, oh, geez, really? cooperating with them. Wow. So you didn't go there for your confessions because you knew. <laughs> they would tell what, the, what, you, what you told them? Oh, my goodness. Yes, you, you are not going to confess. Just do your prayers. And, uh, Forgive me, Father, I thought bad of the communist society here. Whoops, all of a sudden. Whoops, no. <laughs> and that's actually, the, the I think, the pinnacle of what I wanted to get in this uh, first show together, is when we think about how church hurts in our lives, as our listeners, um, almost all of them have stories of ways that they felt let down by the church, were disappointed, discouraged, um, many of whom just quit going. Um, in Romania, the reason, it seems, for underlying just virtually everybody in the country, a general distrust, is because the church hurt them in such a way of a true betrayal, where something like confession, and we need to realize we're talking about the Orthodox Church and don't need to go down, or don't have time to go down that side road of the difference between Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, compared to um, Protestantism, but enough to say you still had confession and, and the priest in the church was to be a sacred place. Confession of all things, a way for people to let out things that they had done, something very important that Jesus had told people to do. The priest was to personify that safe place where you could do it and took the most sacred of things and violated Yes, we felt betrayed then, and we are feeling, uh, feeling be betrayed even now, because uh, church is not what it is supposed to be. Even now, there are priests that, uh, now the priests are paid by the state. So being so, uh, most of them are doing what the ruling party is asking them to. So instead of... Uh, preaching the God's uh, saying, or how do you say? It's, uh, they are speaking about uh, uh, how to vote, what to do, and uh, this is not what church should be. Now, why are they paid? It's not a communist society. When did uh, communism fall? After the fall of the Soviet yes, Union? Yes, 1989. It was the big fall in Northern okay. Europe. Okay, and so ostens ostensibly it's a what, a parliamentary, a democracy? Is it, in fact, a democracy, or is it one of these strong man rule? I don't know enough no, about it. No, it is a democracy, so to speak. <laughs> but, but there is a power in place. And why would the state pay the religious? Why would they pay because, the Because uh, it's a way to um, rule the people easily because they know religion is an important part for Romanians and they go to church now. They are free. They think they are free to go now to the church and they listen to their priests, especially in the small villages. And uh, they are convinced by the priests how to vote. This is how you keep them so close to their political party that's ruling at the time. Let's see if I'm right on this. Here, here's... Um what I ended up seeing, because I went over very open, uh, is, you know, I talked to you about the fact that I was really curious about how orthodoxy would manifest itself um, uh, in the lives of people. And 
what I saw was I, that I first had to really turn off my separation of church and state mindset, which is built in, Paul, to Americans. I yeah, so right. deeply. Fundamental principle, yeah. And to go to, to realize so many places, so many countries in the world, that simply does not exist. In fact, the vast majority, it does not exist. Uh, we're the weird ones that, in a sense, got it in our blood if we're real Americans, the ch separation of church and state. We, we even get it wrong, but we at least get it. Oh, the state's not supposed to be telling the church how to behave, and vice versa. And so you go over there and to many other countries, not just countries, former communist countries and so forth, and not just Orthodox churches. Um, the clergy are paid for by the state, and that sets up a disappointment for hurt I think really quickly, and yeah. and so I would I met a number of people there when I tried to talk to them about God. They couldn't because they couldn't separate the notion of of Jesus or God or the Bible those kind of issues from the church. They just wanted to talk about the church, it's, and it, that's real critical for control, even if it's the socialism of today. Well, we don't approve what the priests are doing now because they have private businesses, they have hotels, they have... Uh, the priests have yes, hotels? the priests have restaurants, <laughs> they have their own businesses, uh, radio stations and so on. And um, we, uh, the state is paying them. We go there and we pay for each service that the priests are doing. We don't receive any receipt. And uh, How do you pay? Do you have to pay an... Cash. In of course. So like going to a movie theater, you got to buy a ticket, you got to pay when you walk in no, the door? No, no, when you walk in. It is um, a box there that you can put money to right. sustain that church. Uh, but then you pay for every service that um, we uh, we have from the priest coming to our homes when it's Eastern, uh, Christmas, and... Uh, St. John. Or funerals, weddings. Yeah, uh, we, yes, some of that for same that thing. too, yeah, but... Right. At the home, when they are coming, and imagine a city with uh, 50,000 uh, to millions people living there, coming into each home to bless that home. They are coming oh. with that holy water and that uh, basil right. bunch, okay? <laughs> and they're expecting a bunch of money to do yes, that. Yes, and right. you do that, so you don't receive anything, and those money goes into their pockets. Uh, priests there um, are uh, driving Mercedes and other <laughs> fancy cars. Well, there's you some ones. of that going on in America. Maybe not the uh, certainly in, in in John's neck of the woods. I'm more the Irish Catholic neck of the woods here, but there's definitely Protestants out there uh, benefiting uh, televangels and stuff here. Yeah, yeah. We we could get down that side road, but I tell you, <laughs> you, you you have really helped us, Theodore. I think even in this short time. Um, maybe get a little bit more empathy to get outside of ourselves for a second. When we think about church hurts, you know, the title of what we're doing is church hurts and, and there's an and about this that we're going to be able to get to, because so far we're just kind of, um, putting, uh, some fuel on mm -hmm. the fire right. to our cynicism. Right. Um, but there's more to the story and you're part of that and your friends are part of that. Um, because in spite of all of those things, um, where you really saw corruption at a, at a deep level, and it continues, um, you were able to um, uh, to turn that into who you are and have the faith that you have, and and friends who challenge and talk about things in wonderful way. But we're going to get into that next time. Um, because let me just say it we have a saying there you don't have to do what the priest is doing just what the priest is saying so what he mm. says in the church is what you have to follow and if he's doing follow the word follow not the, the way word. of the man here yes. right <laughs> follow the idea not the people yes. well, follow what i say not what i do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so i just want to thank you so much and uh, look forward to our next session a thank lot. you for having me here well, there you have it, as we're going to go down and explore our common concerns and questions about where we all headed in the world of spirituality. Because we know church hurts. And right here in Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio.
Dot net.